Amen. Open your Bibles today in the book of Psalms. Psalms. And you're going to want to find uh, Psalm 57. But I'm going, to, I'm going to encourage you to also find Psalm 108 and, uh, and Psalm 112. Um, I was thinking about saying it like that. I'm not sure if this is I, I think it would um, it will enhance your uh, experience today. If you have all of those passages uh, at your fingertips, then we'll be looking at uh, at each of those those psalms today, and uh, at uh, one point or another. And so, uh, Psalm fifty seven is where we're going to begin this morning. Brother uh, Daniel is uh, informing that um, Facebook is working very well. All right, if you're able, found your place in Psalm fifty seven. If you're able to, let's stand today. We're going to read. Um, one verse. Now I'm going to I'll just right now. I'm just going to read these three verses. I want you to hear them. Then I'll have a word of prayer for you to be seated. We'll get into the message this morning. Psalm 57 and verse seven. Listen to this. The Bible says, "My heart is fixed, O oh God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise." Psalm 108 and verse one. A song, a psalm, a song or psalm of David. O oh God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise even with my glory. Psalm 112 and verse 8 of evil tidings, his heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. And I'm going to be preaching this morning on the subject of the fixed heart. Let's bow for prayer. Father, I want to ask you now that your Holy Spirit will bless in, uh, in these next few moments as we uh, look at the word of God. I pray, Heavenly Father, that this message would be a blessing. And I know, Heavenly Father, uh, when when we, people when we've done what we've done this year, going over verses um, where we're talking about the, describing the heart of the mind, I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would um, refresh that today and that you would give us a desire to hear the Word of God on, on a particular subject this morning of the fixed heart. I pray, Heavenly Father, for um, uh, today, and uh, I need filling of the Holy Spirit of God, I need uh, your enablement. I, I need uh, your power. Uh, I need your influence in my life if uh, we're uh, going to, to receive a blessing today. And Lord, we need, as, as individuals, as people, we need your help uh, today that as we look at the Word of God, that you would open our eyes and we can, that we hold things out of my law. So Father, I pray for this today in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. My heart is fixed. Oh, God. We're going to talk about that fixed heart. You know, uh, think about the most common, one of the most common uses of the word fix, fixed or fixed. Um, at least in my mind, when I first think of that, when I is the idea of repairing something or restoring something, something's broken, so you fix it. You all heard that. If it ain't broke, don't fix it thing. But if it is broke, you do fix it or replace it. And um, so, um, you know, fixing something, something is broken, you fix it. Friday, uh, my son came over uh, to my house and he fixed my fence. And um, I would like to be able to say that he helped me fix my fence. But that isn't really what happened. That was the intention that he would help me fix my fence. But in actual fact, um, he fixed the fence and I supported him in doing it. <laughs> so, He's a working machine, and, um, and my machine doesn't work quite that well anymore. And so uh, uh, the fence had gone into um, some disrepair over the course of 20 years' time. You know, there's some weathering that takes place in those things. But also during those 20 years, uh, that fence had been chewed on by horses and goats, and it had been climbed on by grandchildren, and it had been run into by me. Um, I was pulling my uh, travel trailer, my camper trailer one time and uh, in early in the morning we were coming home from a camping trip and I just forgot that I had the trailer behind me and I, I turned the corner and uh, too tight and, and, and pulled my trailer into the fence and um, I, my, I, the, the redeeming part is I did, I was able to impress my wife uh, when the trailer was now caught in the fence and I couldn't back up. I couldn't go forward and we were in the fence. I jacked the trailer up and then pushed it off of the jacks and, you know, about two or three feet. And she was just amazed that I knew how to do something like that. And so that makes me feel good that uh, she, I, I still have it, the ability to amaze her. But anyway, uh, that it, it has 
wounds. The fence has wounds and it breaks in it because of my doing that. Um, and then um, the most recent thing was I had a couple of cattle. When I, I bought these calves, I, I had asked a fellow about calves. You know, I wanted to see about getting some calves. I asked a fellow about calves and, and he said, just be sure you get tame ones, calves, tame ones. And uh, I didn't pay enough attention to that instruction. And uh, uh, I wanted cheap ones is what I wanted. I wanted, didn't want tame ones. I wanted cheap ones. And so I bought these calves and, uh, and they were not tame. In fact, we had to, the guy I bought them from actually, um, I, can I say that I'm putting this online? The guy that I bought them from choked them out so that we could get so, out unconscious so that we could get them in the trailer. <laughs> they were that mild. <laughs> it was impossible to deal with them, and so and uh, so he, anyway. And the, when I got them to the house and released them from the trader, they immediately—I mean—they took off across the pasture and ran full speed into the fence. And when they bounced off the fence there, they ran full speed into the fence over here. And, and um, they never got through the fence that day, but um, before uh, they became hamburger, they did get through the fence. Uh, I was at home and heard a loud pop and looked out the window, and there the calves are were in my yard and no longer in the pasture, and uh, um, and uh, we had things to fix. So my son came over and they helped me because if I'm ever going to have any kind of livestock again, and it won't be calves, um, if I ever have any kind of livestock again. I, the fences fixed, uh, but I got. I found it interesting as I was studying, preparing for today's message. I found it interesting that, uh, um, in fact, I almost came to the place where I was convinced the word "fixed" to use the fi the word "fixed" as a to mean repair is an improper use of the word. Um, neither Merriam-Webster's 1828 dictionary or the Merriam-Webster's online gives that as a definition, nor does any other dictionary that I could find with the exception of Cambridge's English dictionary. And uh, it only has, a, it's a very obscure reference to using the word fix to mean repair or restore something. It doesn't mean that. Originally, that's not what it meant. It, it, that is uh, one of those words that, you know, we start using when, you know, something is really cool, you say it's hot. It's really is stupid. But anyway, so that's, and we, so we say we fix something. So um, when they say Ford, fix or repair daily, um, it, that's not a Ford. It's a, um, because fix isn't repair, so uh, you can't use that anymore. That's not a proper use of the, of the word anymore. But I did think that was an interesting thing. The, the psalmist says, my heart is fixed, O God, my heart is fixed. And it seems to me that a case could be made for saying that um, uh, having a fixed heart in the sense of a repaired or restored heart would be a biblical concept that we have a heart that needs repair and that God fixes our heart, repairs our heart. Seems like a, a you know, you could make a biblical argument for that. Uh, our hearts do uh, get broken in this world. We get, um, we get cheated on, we get lied to, we get laughed at, we get stolen from, we get jilted, and all of those things, disappointments come, and discouragements happen, and difficulties pile up in a person's life so that if, we aren't very, if we're not careful, our hearts can become uh, bitter and angry and grieved and broken, and, um, and so that we have uh, hard hearts, black hearts, uh, wicked hearts, all of those kind of things. But Jesus offers us, doesn't he, a new heart. I would say that's fixed, except for it's not good English. So I can see a good case for using the word that way. But what it means, the word fixed means originally, uh, that's not its primary meaning to talk about repairing something. The primary meaning of the word, according to Webster's 1828 dictionary, and every other one I can find, is uh, fixed means settled established, firm, fast, stable, or nailed. Um, about the closest thing we really did to fixing my, no, I said about the closest thing that Pastor Caleb really did to fixing my fence is he nailed some boards. So that really is a fixing it because he nailed some boards. The word to nail something down, that's a legitimate part of the definition. Um, the history of this word actually has, 
um, of the word fix has some has more to do with gardening or planting something and has to do with having roots and uh, digging down and something that has roots. And so from this definition of uh, something that is fixed, stable, and that has roots, um, and from the three verses, the three passages where the Bible says our heart can be fixed, I want to uh, preach to you three truths today. So out of Psalm 57, I want to speak first of all today about the fact that, um, that the fixed heart has um, roots so that it survives troublesome or difficult times. He says in Psalm 57, I'm just going to read verses 6 and 7 right now, but um, you might want to make reference to uh, have a opportunity to glance at the rest of the, of the psalm as we go through. He says in Psalm 57, verses 6 and 7, they have prepared it for my my soul bowed down. They have digged a pit before me into the midst whereof they are fallen themselves. Selah. My heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. So the psalmist, the Bible tells us this psalm are, uh, is that the psalmist in this case is King David, and he describes a very difficult time in his life. And so in verse one, he says these were times of calamity. There are calamities going on in his life. In verse three, these were times of reproach, and reproach somebody uh, mocking you and depressing you and, and reproaching you. In verse four, he says he says that there were people around him that were acting like uh, lions with spears and arrows and swords in their mouth. He said that these people had prepared a net for his steps. They're trying to trap him. They're trying to trick him. They're trying to trip him up and catch him in his uh, in his ways. They digged a pit before him. He says, although they digged a pit for, to catch him in, but they're going to fall in the pit themselves. And he says that all of these things, this difficulty, this trouble that he is in, these difficult times that he's in, has brought him to the place where he says, and he says, my soul is bowed down. It's hard time. This was a difficult time. It's hard for him. Life can present some hard times, can't it? Things can happen in life that are very, very difficult. That uh, uh, where the where the heart can become, you know, uh, sore wounded in those things. I, I think some of us are going through some maybe difficult times right now in our lives. Uh, uh, you know, I'm a pastor, and I think about things the way pastors think about things, and. And um, and many of my peers are, are preachers and pastors as well. And I and I know that uh, that many pastors that uh, many of the pastors that I know are 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 going through very very difficult times right now. Besides those that are, are sick, and some of them are sick even right now and in the hospital even right now. Uh, but besides those, there are other very difficult things that are happening right now. I prayed not too long ago for a list of preachers and. Um, you know, um, and I, this is one of my pet peeves, and so I'm not trying to, you know, stop on your toes. If you're one of these kind of people, I'm not upset at you for this, but I'll just tell you. So I prayed for this list of preachers, and I sent them a text message to tell them that I prayed for them. And um, now I don't like getting, this is my pet peeve, I don't like getting group texts. You know, where you say, hello, pa hello, I prayed for you today, or good morning, I prayed for you today. And then somehow you, you, you know, and it's got my name on the text, but somehow you've hidden 50 people underneath there. So that um, you prayed for 50 people, but you just sent out one text to all of them. And I don't know that you sent one text to all of them. So I send you back and uh, God bless you, brother. I am so very thankful that you did that. And uh, it means so very much that you would pray for me. And, um, and then it goes out to 50 people. That, uh, that I don't know that I get that text. So uh, I choose not to do that. I don't send out group texts. And, uh, and it's what I pray for this group of preachers the other day. And I and what I do in every day, I, I want to make sure they know it's not a group text. So I named them by name. Good morning, brother so and so. Good morning, pastor so and so. And I named them by name. And then I make a personal, uh, I, I write a personal message to each one of them. So I have this group of pastors that I pray for the other day. And um, uh, I don't know, 20 or 30 pastors that I prayed for uh, by name and personally, and I sent them out these personal messages. And, and so then I began getting one by one, I began getting messages back from a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them. And I just want to read some of the messages that I got back. One pastor wrote back and said, you know, I just said, I prayed for you this morning. I want you to know, brother, I prayed for you today. And he wrote back and said, amen. Got zero sleep last night and this morning. Um, I, this morning I did my devotions and I prayed for you. Got zero sleep last night. 
Um, another one wrote back and said, thank you for these words, brother. I'm in a situation today where I'm truly seeking the truth, not from the biblical standpoint, but dealing with circumstances. Another one wrote back and said, thank you, my friend. I can't remember a more trying time in my ministry. The prayers are much appreciated. I mean, preachers are going through things right now. Preachers are going through things. I told you last week, and probably some of you had seen that little video by Jack Traber, Dr. Traber's ministry, and always, uh, you know, being on the top side, you always want to be smiling. And that's, uh, in that group, they kind of think that's the symbol of having the Holy Spirit of God on your life. If you're smiling and happy, then, you know, God's, in, uh, you know, then you're filled with the Holy Ghost. And, and uh, you know, always want to be smiling and happy. We'll always want to be on top of the circumstances and, and all that. And, um, and then this last week, uh, he was in, and, you know, just the way things worked out, he was informed he wasn't going to be able to open up their college uh, that they have down there. And, um, and so, and he was in this uh, in this uh, video that he made. He's almost in tears in the video, but he describes uh, speaking with one of their state representatives. And he had been in communication. He knows this guy personally. Had been in communication with state representative, asking him to you know please intercede on our behalf by and to the mayor uh, to the uh, to the governor and please um, uh, 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 get the governor to release the college and uh, release our church and allow us. Uh, to get back to to, to ministry and get back to what we're doing, and and um, and and Brother Treber said that the representative said, Pastor Treber, I've never heard you discouraged before. Now, um, for a pastor to be discouraged, I mean that's like you know saying that we're wicked. You, know, you must be backslidden if you're discouraged. And he said, and he told the representative, he said, oh, I'm not discouraged. I'm broken hearted. And you can judge what you want to about all, but I am saying that that there is. There is a, is a hard time right now for a number of pastors. And uh, now I hear um, positive reports from some pastors at this time also, but even the positive reports, if you, you know, you, you, you know, you, there's, you got to take the positive even with a grain of salt. <clears throat> One pastor uh, wrote and said, uh, and he said this, he said, um, we've never closed our church. We're not going to obey the governor. We obey only the Lord. So we still have two thirds of our church attending. Well, praise the Lord. <laughs> but what about the third? <laughs> you know, so uh, you know, I mean, there's a, uh, there's a, even there, there's a little bit of. He's trying to find, make as positive as he can possibly make the thing, but it's a difficult time. I, I know pastors uh, are not the only people today, though, uh, and I, and I, and I feel like I, I need to, you know. Yeah. To help you to know or to let you know, I know that I'm not the only one who has trouble right now and that pastors are not the only people who have trouble right now. I, I know that we're not the only people who feel like we're surrounded by the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongues sharp sword. We're not the only ones who feel like that. Um, King David said in those circumstances, he said in, in verse Seven, my heart is fixed, O oh God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. And I noticed that he says, my heart is fixed twice. Now, uh, there's a couple of things that I've come to mind. Whenever you see something repeated in the Bible, that's that, the, the, the Hebrew way of, of emphasizing or, 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 or strengthening a thought is to repeat it. The more often it's repeated, the more important that statement is. And so here's King David I'm writing on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, but he is also responding to his own personal circumstance. He says, my heart is fixed, oh God. My heart is fixed. He wants to make sure his heart is fixed. He's, he's planted his heart deep so that he, those roots could find lots and lots of fresh water. I, uh, a number of years ago now, um, I planted some blueberries along the fence road in our house and and uh, I've tried them before, blueberries, but I, I thought they would look pretty, you know, have blueberries along the fence. We'd have blueberries to eat and all that. And I was warned when I got the blueberry plants that um, it would be several years before they'd actually produce many blueberries. And it looked like this year was going to be the year. They did produce this year a little bit. I mean, I don't know, but um, I planted um, six, seven plants. Two of them have died. Um, two of them, I thought, died, but they just died down. And I kept, you know, the roots found enough 
to stay alive. And now there's little sprigs coming back up of, of, uh, of um, a blueberry plants and things like that. But uh, we had some blueberries and Anita's been out there picking blueberries. And one day she came and says, the plants aren't looking very good. And I went out there and those blueberry plants were dry and that went with rain. And uh, so they had enough root to be um, to get some water, but when it got hot enough, long enough, their roots weren't deep enough to find that real fresh, good water. David says, "Well, I didn't. I'm not just planted. I am planted deep. My heart is fixed to God. My heart is fixed. I'm, I buried it down deep so that I can get into the fresh water, so that I can get into the cool water. I, I've got dig down deep so that I can." so that I can tap into the very presence, to the very source of life, who is Almighty God. And he knew that if he was going to survive the trouble that he was going through, and you know, we often think, you know, here's King David, he's the greatest of their kings, and he won all these victories and all that kind of stuff. He's, but David lived a life of constant trouble. I mean, it wasn't, there was not a time in his life from the day he was anointed to be king to the day he died, there wasn't a time in his life that he didn't have somebody out to get him. Uh, it was always that way in his life. But he said, my heart is fixed, oh God, is planted deep. Uh, not just a shallow, you know, so that it, not some kind of shallow religious experience there. But he knew that he needed to have a real relationship, a solid relationship with God. He needed to tap down into the very source of God. I just want to say um, a short, listen, a short devotion and a simple prayer won't get you through troublesome. I'm, I'm just telling you that if you're going to want, if you want a life that's lived for God, if you want a life that is solid, if you want a life that is fixed and firm and established and stable and that will stand the test of time when the troubles of life come, you need to have something that digs down deep into the presence of God. And too much of Christianity today, as you know, praying for dinner and, uh, and uh, maybe listening to a prayer of the pastor or uh, reading a little daily bread devotional or something like that. And well, I read my daily bread devotion and uh, and I prayed for my breakfast and so I'm good to go for the day. And I don't want to listen. I don't want to discourage you uh, in your in your Christian walk and say, "Well, Pastor, I just can't do anymore." I don't want to discourage you, and I I don't want to criticize what you've been doing in your walk with the Lord. But I do want to encourage you: dig deeper, dig deeper to live through troubles and times and, and difficult times. You've got to dig deeper. How do I do it, Pastor? You don't understand uh, the, the circumstance. You don't understand the pressure. You don't understand all of the demands on my life. Listen, separate from things that are worldly so that you can spend more time doing things that bring your soul into communion with God. Spend more time in Bible reading and meditation. Spend more time in real prayer. Spend more time uh, doing things like writing and journaling your communion with God. And there's something really incredible, special, that you not only read your Bible and pray, but you record. Even if I'm not talking about you have to write books. I'm talking about just recording a, by a few sentences. God spoke to me today, and this is what he said. I mean, get to a place where those are part of your life. Psalm 1, verses 1 through 6. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his, forth his fruit in season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. I'm going to go ahead and read the rest of the the song, just because I think we should, it kind of goes on to the other side. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the, of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Man, you want to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, and it doesn't happen by accident, and it doesn't happen with a shallow walk with God. It doesn't happen by saying, well, I'm a Christian, and so God's got me taken care of, and therefore I can just live my life and let this world pull me wherever it wants me to go. Or you're going to have to dig deep. You're going to need to fix your heart. You're going to need to become strong and stable. It's going to meet me. I mean, if you want a life that doesn't get moved and tossed about by every wind of doctrine and every uh, uh, the king is the devil. If you want that kind of a heart, you're going to need to dig deep into the things of God. 
concerning the, uh, the, the, the fixed heart, number two, a fixed heart stands tall so that it's strong and it's confident. Go to a, a Psalm 108 with me. Psalm 108 and verse 1. We'll start there and we'll look at some other verses in the chapter here in just a second. Psalm 108 verse 1 says, A song or a song or psalm of David, and then he says, O oh God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise even with my glory. He says, My heart is fixed. And then the, 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 the song, the thing I wanted to point out from there. So he says, My heart is fixed, I'll sing and give praise and uh, give and give uh, I will sing and give praise even with my glory. But I want you to see what he says in verses eleven through thirteen of this same song. So he says starting verse eleven, Wilt not thou, O God, who hast cast us off, wilt not thou, O God, go forth with our hosts? Give us help from trouble, for vain is the help of man. Through God we shall do valiantly, for he it is that shall tread down our enemies. So he has enemies, and he has trouble, and he has difficulties, but he's not afraid. He's not afraid. Uh, God would help him in his trouble. He knew that God would help him to do valiantly. He knew that God would tread down his enemies, and because he knew those things, because his heart was fixed because he knew those things. Now, I got to looking at this, and, and I noticed a few things based on verses, uh, um, verses 11 through uh, 13. I'd just like to share with you. Number one, I, I noticed, first of all, that he's been chastened by God. So he's got enemies. But one of the reasons that he is, his heart is fixed is because he's been chastened by God. Verse 11, wilt, thou, wilt not thou, O God, who has cast us off, Wilt not thou, O God, go forth with our, with our host? Now, he, rec he recognizes that there has been a time of discipline in his life and in the life of his people, the nation of Israel. You know, um, this life on this earth is supposed to be a period, and you know this is, as a believer, you know this, it's, it's supposed to be a period of refinement, correction, and molding into the image of the Lord. Now, we get it kind of mixed up. We think what sometimes what we think is uh, we get saved now that we're saved. Um, you know, when we get to heaven, God will take care of all our bad stuff. But now that we're saved, the thing I got to do is I got to spend my life reaching the world. But really, that's not what the Bible says that we spend our life doing. The Bible says that in this life, God is uh, engaged in the process of sanctifying us and molding us into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yes, we do win souls. And yes, we are evangelists. And yes, we do try to reach the world and see churches start. But that's all God do working, um, using us as he molds us. Too many people stop be, ever being molded, and there, there's a stop right here. I'm as good as I need to be. Now just let me make everybody else as good as me. Kind of an idea. And, uh, but life really is supposed to be about being molded and corrected and refined into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't expect that to be easy. It's going to be challenging. It's going to be some difficulties. And just like God did, he wants to mold Job. And Job is a perfect man and just. And, um, and he is chewed evil and all of that. But Job, as as you know, God says, have you considered to say, have you considered my servant Job, a perfect and just man, one that uh, feareth God and escheweth evil? Have you considered him? I would think, well, man, Job must have been quite the guy. But God's not done molding Job. But he's going to use Satan. He's going to use circumstance. He's going to use challenge and difficulty to bring about even more refinement in the life of Job. Here's a guy who starts out wonderful, but Job's going to be better when this thing is all over. When he's tried, he says, Job, verse 23 and verse 10, um, he knoweth the way that I take, and when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as good. There's going to be some difficulty, but God's, God's going to use that difficulty to make uh, make him more Christ-like, more God-like, uh, more more God of a godly man. Listen, um, uh, if your heart is fixed, one of the things you're going to realize with a fixed heart is that you've got to go through a challenge. You've got to go through difficulty. You've got to go through trial if you're going to ever be in the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not like, well, listen, I am fine right here. When I get to heaven, God can do whatever he wants to. But right now, just let me have a good time. 
Today is the day he's molding you. Today is the day he's refining you. And um, and if you've got a heart, fixed heart, you'll understand that. You'll plant deep in the, in, into the, the tap root of God. You'll allow him to feed you. You'll allow him to establish you. You'll allow him to make you stable as he makes you into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. The other thing I noticed, another thing that I noticed in, in Psalm 108 verses and uh, verse 12 is that... Um, Okay, so um, he's going through some difficulty. He's rejected the help of man. Look at verse 12. Give us help from trouble, for vain is the help of man. God, I need your help. I understand the help of man is useless. In my estimation, this is one of the most necessary things that I see in modern Christianity. Um, I don't know about anywhere else in the world. I, I know something about the United States. I don't even know much about the United States. I know something about the Pacific Northwest, but I, I know this, that we've had so many resources uh, for help that we haven't ever really needed to rely upon the Lord for so long that a lot of us wouldn't know how to rely on him if we had to. There's, there, we have too much help from man. We have no experience um, living under the resources of God. We, we think God helps us by putting us in the path of the help of people. And no doubt that that happens sometimes, but it isn't uh, the only way that God works. And certainly you don't want to look for, well, God, I need help, therefore I need somebody. And so I start looking for that somebody. And if there's someone shows up, that must be from God. That isn't, no, we trust God. And if God chooses to use Somebody to to be to 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 help us. Well, praise the Lord for it. But we don't trust somebody. We trust the Lord. I had a conversation with a, a missionary just this this last week. I don't remember. So it's been within the you know it was Monday through Thursday. Is that last week? Because this is the first day of this week. So it wasn't this week. It wasn't yesterday. The other day is too vague of a term. So this last week, I had a conversation with the missionary, and um, this missionary was. Um, he was complaining. I mean, there was, I mean, there's no other way to say it. He was just complaining and, and he, and he was trying to make a point. And I, and you know, uh, people, you, he had people, there were people who agreed with his point. There were others who didn't, but he was trying to make this point. What he was saying is the, the, the missions support um, system, the current mission support system is broken. It needs to be fixed as in repaired, restored, replaced. Not stable, but it needs to be repaired. Uh, the mission support system is, is repaired. And, um, and so what he did is, is he wrote out, he said, this is why it's broken. And he gave eight reasons why he thought it was broken. I didn't write them all down. Let me see if I got it. In fact, I don't even have them in my notes at all. He gave eight reasons why it was broken. Number one, uh, I won't remember them all, and uh, but one of them, number one was uh, the reason why the mission support system is broken. We have to travel all across the country and risk our lives on the roads to the United States of America to raise our support. And I told him, I know people who spend their entire adult life saving for retirement so that they can buy a motorhome and drive all across America, saying the places that you're getting paid to go see. And, uh, but he's saying this is a dangerous thing, and we shouldn't have to do this, uh, this kind of thing. And then, um, uh, so he said, um, um, uh, what are some of the other ones? I'm trying to look it up. And so anyway, he, had, he had several. Um, oh, one of them is um, competition among missionaries. Uh, we have to go into a church and we have to impress the church so that we get the mission dollar instead of this other missionary, instead of the other missionaries who are coming. And I said, why don't you trust the Lord? Because you don't actually, these churches aren't paying your way to, as a missionary anyway. God is paying your way and he may use that church. You don't need that. If God doesn't want you to have that church's Support, you don't need that church's support. God will give you support somewhere else. And then he said, um, um, one of the things is uh, dishonesty. And uh, uh, churches are all different. And so we can't be, we have to, we have, or he said, we have to hide who we are. Because um, we, if we let churches know that we don't believe exactly like them, then they won't support us. And I said, transparency. And uh, you be who you are, 
And what will happen is God will lead you to churches that believe like you, and that way you're reproducing their ministry rather than just getting their money. And uh, uh, um, uh, then there was the hardships thing. And so, I, you know, I just um, point out that missionaries, missions support has always been difficult. Um I've got this in my notes. I won't get too far away. It's always been difficult. Anabaptist mission, mission missionaries often thought support. Um, often the Anabaptists, how they, they would get supported is like this: um, is uh, you know you're going to be called to one. I always think of is Iceland, a missionary Anabaptist missionary going to Iceland, and what they did is they gave him a hammer and a set of tools and taught him how to use it to construct things. That was what his church gave him. And then he hiked from Germany to the Netherlands, I think it was, where he found a ship's captain who needed a cabinet put into his, in, in his, um, whatever they call it, in the boat. And so he built a cabinet in the ship's, uh, in the, sh the, the, the captain's room. And for, in exchange for building uh, the cabinet, the ship uh, took him to, uh, Iceland let him off, couldn't get onto their no, no uh, docks, and so just let him off, gave him a rowboat to row the rest of the end. And this missionary's job was to get in, in Iceland was to plant a garden and to build a house, to live long enough to plant a garden and to build a house for the couple uh, uh, before he died, so that for the couple that were coming next year to live in. And that was missions. And now we're complaining because we have to travel around the country. Um, for a couple of years. Um, Hudson Taylor was a missionary back in the 1800s. And I, I, I can't remember, if it, I, I actually, I, I can't remember if this story is from Hudson Taylor or from David Livingston. There's, there's two or three missionaries from that era that whose stories are not, um, that are, whose stories are pretty similar. Um, they all had a medical, they all got some medical training. They were all going to be missionaries uh, in foreign lands that had not had, had no missions experience whatsoever, uh, and they all uh, got some medical training so that they could be able to use their medical skills uh, to as a as a tool to uh, in their ministries. And so I can't remember if this was uh, Hudson Taylor, David Livingston. I think it was David Livingston. Actually, this happens. So while he's being trained, getting his Bible training, his theology training, he was working for a doctor in, in London. And the doctor that he was working for um, was um, notorious for getting to pay him. For, for getting to pay him. And so uh, he would, you know, he's working a week, two weeks, whatever it's going to be, and, and the doctor doesn't give him his pay. And um, I think it's David Livingston determined he was never, he would never remind, you know, it wasn't in the days like, you know, these days there's so much keeping track of that. It's a gentleman's agreement between him and his boss. And uh, so he decided, though, that if he could not trust God to remind the doctor to pay him, how could he ever trust God to remind, when he see, the, the doctor to pay him who sees him every day? How would he ever be able to trust the churches uh, to send him support when they haven't seen him for years and years? Maybe never again. And so he decided he would never ask this doctor for his pay that he to remind him to pay him. He would only ask God to remind his doctor to pay him so that he could learn. He wanted to know that he could ask God and God was capable to remind the doctor so that when he got to the foreign field, when he got to the country he was going to serve, that he knew he could ask God to remind the churches back home that he needed support and, he, and trust God that God would remind them and burden them and get the and, and get the, the, the support. To, I, I'm just saying we haven't had to exercise much faith probably the last 150 years. So not many of us know how to do it, to live by faith. Not many of us know how to do it. Nita and I have had some times where we've lived by faith. And um, frankly, um, um, it, 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 it's one of those, the best memories that I have in my life is those times, and not that it was easy times, but but to, but to know that you are in desperate need, to know that there is no possible way for, you, for that need to be met unless God answers, to know there is no one you can ask, there is no one you can come, turn to, there is no way to get a hold of anyone even to ask them, and to know that God still puts it on the hearts of men, and God still burdens, and that God still provides, it is an incredible, incredible experience. Not very many people 
in our world ever experienced that. So the psalmist says, my heart is fixed. Vain is the help of man. I am trusting God only. My help comes from God because vain is the help of man. And the third thing that he says uh, in verses 11 through 13, he, he points this out, is that it was God who would tread down his enemies. Look at in verse 13. Through God we shall, now this is a very interesting passage of scripture. Look at this passage, look carefully. Through God we shall do val valiantly, for he it is that shall tread down our enemies. So this is real interesting. The, the verse breaks down into two parts. Through God we shall do valiantly. So um, the people of God are going to do something. And it's going to be valiant. Valiant means effective. It's going to work. The people of God are going to do something, and what they do is going to work. And then he says, for he it is that shall tread down our enemies. The people of God don't tread down the enemies. They do something valiantly. They do something that's effective. They do something that works, but they're not the one who fights the enemy. They're not the one who defeats the enemy. The people won't tread them down at all. God will do that. It's, it's not, listen, it's not us that accomplishes anything. It's always God. It gives us the privilege of making it look like we did something. But it's always God. Remember Revelation chapter 19 when Jesus comes um, out of heaven and he's got the armies of heaven following him. The Bible says, you know, there's going to be the armies uh, uh, of Antichrist gathered together in the valley of Megiddo. They're going to withstand Jesus and the, and the, and the, and the, and the, the armies of heaven. But the, then the Bible describes the battle of Armageddon and it's Jesus who defeats all of the enemies with the sharp two-edged sword that proceeds out of his mouth. The armies do nothing but watch. Now it's a valiant thing. I'm just, gonna, I'm just telling you, I've ridden a horse. Riding a horse out of heaven to the earth, that's going to be a pretty, that's a doozy of a ride right there. You might say, well, it's not a real horse. That's a figurative thing. I don't know if it's figurative or not. I'm just saying that's a pretty cool thing. You're on a horse right out of heaven. That's a valiant thing. To be able to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, that is a valiant thing. To be one of those, and I think it is uh, all of us, I think it's the believers who are the armies of heaven that follow him, and to be to be coming, following Jesus out of heaven to this earth uh, to establish his kingdom, that is a valiant thing. But the enemy is defeated by Jesus and not by the armies. Uh, we had uh, Tyler Gross here. Wednesday night, and uh, Brother LaGrosse was one of the students at the college when I taught at the college. Uh, he was there at Pacific Coast, and then he moved with the college to Heartland and was a part of all of that. And, and so it was a blessing to have Tad here um, last Wednesday night. I enjoyed that. And it, was a, it was a blessing to see him. And uh, so the next day, um, he sent me a message and said, I'm thankful you're doing, he, said, he wrote this, he said, I'm thankful you're doing a great work in the Pacific. And I wrote back to him and said, uh, uh, um, it, uh, I am working in the Pacific Northwest, but if anything great is happening, God did that. We think too much of ourselves. I, I was thinking about this the other day. I told uh, my son and, and, uh, and uh, I'm going to think of your name in just a sec, Brother Daniel. Um, I was, I was thinking this, I uh, told them this, um, uh, and please listen to me, listen, hear me out before you judge what I'm about to say. My whole ministry has been a series of failures followed by rescues from God. <laughs> when you get right down to it, I mean, it, it's uh, so, uh, and I'm not going to go through all of them. Be, I don't want to do that someday. I'd like to, but, um, but I'm not going to go through all. So um, we went to. Anita and I and, um, and my friend Mike Riggs, the three of us, when uh, God had called me to preach and God had called me to preach, so we're going to go off again. But I was, gonna, I was on my way. We we're going to go to Virginia to go to Lynchburg, uh, the college in Lynchburg. And uh, so we were headed off to go to, to Lynchburg, but I uh, was going to stop in the summer. Mike and I, uh, Riggs, were going to work in the summer. Uh, and we didn't know what we were going to do. We actually got, uh, he had his car, Mike had his car, we had my truck and trailer. And, uh, and uh, we were... What uh, we're in the union, and so the union said, "Well, there's work in Oakland, California. There's work in Denver, Colorado. There's work in Houston, Texas." And but the, the business agent said, uh, "It's raining in Oklahoma, in Oakland right now." And I don't know if you know this: iron workers don't work in the rain. It's a kind of a it's a policy. We don't work in the rain. We're too sweet. 
And um, <laughs> just give me a second. Please. That's what we said. Anyway, so uh, we don't. We, and so there's work. It's raining in Oklahoma, in Oakland, so don't go there. And what do you? So what my business agent said is, he said, if I were you, I'd go to Denver. And if you don't have a job in seven days, figure you're halfway to Houston. The seventh, we got to Denver. Anita and me and Mike, we got to Denver. We had five dollars left between us. We're not talking about five dollars in our pocket and money in the bank. We had five dollars. We'd used all of the money that we had on credit and in the bank. We had five dollars when we got to Denver. And um, um, we stay there and we go and signed up at the Union Hall to look for work on the seventh day. Mike and I both got jobs on the seventh day. We couldn't have gone to Houston. We had five dollars. God rescued us on the seventh day. He came um, during the time when we were in Denver. I got up all under conviction. I needed to start a church. And, you know, God didn't want to go just to Bible college. I wanted to start a church. And so I talked to my the executive vice president of the college and then I talked to uh, the pastor of my church and, uh, and we found a little town of 1,200 people in it and uh, and we started knocking doors and I, I uh, rented the basement of the Methodist church building in, in Platteville, Colorado. We started knocking doors and I'm just going to tell you something. Um, it was a disaster. It was a disaster. But one day while I was out knocking doors, um, uh, I went to this house, knocked on the door. A lady comes out and says, are you the Platteville Baptist Church that's meeting in the Methodist building or the Platteville Baptist Church that's meeting downtown? I didn't know it, but another guy started, another guy started an independent Baptist church at the same time and as I did. Both of us called our church Platteville Baptist Church. I called them up on the phone and told them what I was doing. And he said, well, I'll tell you what. And I just said, I'd like to work with you at Platteville Church. He said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll pay you as much as I'm getting, which was nothing. And, uh, and we planned, and, and it was the best thing in the world. Brother Smith um, uh, gave me uh, convictions on my Bible, gave me convictions on the church. I mean, it was the best thing in the world. Then we left there and went to Astoria. And, uh, and I'm, well, I just, I can go on and on. God, everything I did, I take a step, and it was a disaster. And God would somehow bless us. And somehow I would take a step and it would be a disaster, another step, and it would be a disaster that God would rescue me out of it and my family. Sometimes I used to say, God, I know I'm nothing, but because of my wife and kids, won't you please get me out of this mess that I just made? And God just kept doing it over and over and over. And then one day I realized this. Um, when I started the ministry, before I went off to Bible college, I'd be listening, I'd listen to the old time gospel hour. Uh, on television, and uh, and one of the things that um, that Jerry Falwell said all the time on the Old Time God Gospel Hour, he'd say, "Climb out on a limb so far that if God doesn't hold you up, it's going to break." And that's what I've been doing all my life. I just get out so far that there isn't any possible way I can survive unless God does something. And then once He does something there, I climb out on another limb. Now someday I'm going to stop climbing out. And someday I'm going to stop climbing out on another limb. Uh, I'd like to be able to do that. In fact, I have nightmares about that. You know, oh no, why did you do that? You had it so good. And uh, but uh, anyway, so uh, just learning to trust God. And when you God does it, but then He lets it look like we did something. That's a great thing. And finally, I'll be done with this. We turn to Psalm 112. We'll be done once we get done, done with this. Um, a fixed heart. Um, it's is concerning the fixed heart, it is obvious. The fixed heart is so obvious that it brings glory to God. Look at verses uh, Psalm 112, verses 7 through 10. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting the Lord. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he see his desire upon his enemies. He hath dispersed. He hath given to the poor. His righteousness endureth forever. His horn shall be exalted with honor. The wicked shall see it and be grieved. He shall gnash with his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. And so from verse 11, I see that the man with the fixed heart, number one, he's generous uh, because it says he's dispersed abroad. He's given to the poor. Uh, he's generous. He's righteous. It says his righteousness endureth forever. So he's Christ-like. He's godly. 
Um, he, he, this man with the fixed heart is reputable, uh, where it says his horn shall be exalted with honor. The idea of a horn has to do with um, your authority, your influence in, in, in the world around you. So this man, his horn uh, uh, shall be exalted with honor. People know him uh, to be a man of dignity, of good reputation. And notice this, it says in, um, in the final verse, verse 12, it says, his, um, the wicked shall see it and be grieved. I think that's an interesting phrase. I want to turn over to this and look. The wicked shall see it and be great. He shall gnash with his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. Remember in Psalm 57 where he says that he's surrounded with the sons of men and they have teeth like arrows and spears and a tongue like a sword. Now all of a sudden, it's the wicked. It's uh, the wicked shall see it. And be, I got to find it again and read it one more time. The wicked shall see it and be great. He shall gnash with his teeth and melt away. They have these teeth that are like spears and, and swords, but now they're just gnashing with their teeth. When he sees this righteous man whose heart is fixed, he sees that he's generous. He sees that he's Christ-like and godly and that he cannot be moved from his testimony. He sees that he is a man of honor and all of a sudden the wicked see that and say, wow, there's nothing I can do against this guy. There's nothing that I can do about him. His reputation is not only among his friends, but it's also among those who are wicked. And he brings glory to God in every area of his life. So he brings glory to God when he's in church and he brings glory to God in his home and he brings glory to God at work and he brings glory to God even when he's in the atmosphere and the environment where he's surrounded with the sons of men whose teeth are like spears and arrows. He's still bringing glory to God. It's not just that, uh, and it goes all the way back to having the fixed heart. Not just that he says, I won't be moved from my faith. I've known a lot of people who says, I'll never stop loving God. But they're um, a long way from God today. I know a lot of people have said it was kind of thing. Not just what you say, boasting and proud. I'll never change. I'll never doubt. I'll never do this. No, but he has purposely planted his roots deeply in the things of God so that he is established and fixed and, and cannot be moved away from the Lord. So I want to ask you today, I'm getting ready to finish, I want to ask you today, how is your relationship with God? Is it, is it fixed, rooted, and real, genuine? How is your relationship with God? Not just people know of you as a Christian, how is your relationship with God? Can, can, how do you, you know, well, you know, what do you mean? Can you speak with God? Can you commune with God? Can you get along with God and know you've been with God? Can, can you trust the Lord without leaning on somebody to hold you up? Can you trust God to hold that limb when there's nobody else underneath you? Do you know you can trust God? How's your relationship with God? Heavenly Father, I wanna ask you now that your Holy Spirit will minister to us as we spend just these next few moments in, uh, I, in my mind, the, the word that came to, to my thought was reflection. A time where we just do some self-examination. My heart is fixed, oh God. My heart is fixed. Lord, I, I think these are days when we as our believers, we who call upon your name, we need to be certain that our roots are dug deeply. The, the flood waters are flowing and uh, at least 